for a well-known laser and scientific company named Spectra Physic. During his employment there, he was responsible for technical product marketing and applications development. He traveled all over Europe and Asia, uh, introducing new products to audiences in the UK, France, Germany, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, and Thailand. And he spoke in front of audiences up to 200 people. And uh, most of his stuff had to be translated by translators in order to uh, service his market. So he, when he moved to Florida, that was in 2000, well, 2000, and he started PC Panther in 2003. And his goal is to provide customer-centric computer and IT services to small businesses. That's the Lance you know. And so he currently is an ambassador for the chamber, and you know that too. But please help me welcome Lance Hellinger. Well, it is great to be here. Thank you all for coming on board. I'm really excited about the opportunity and uh, interacting with you. I know you're going to have a lot of questions. So what we wanted to do, because some, really everybody's working from home, is to really focus this on kind of how do you work safely and efficiently and smart from your home versus working in your office? Although sometimes uh, we have some customers that remote into their work computer because there's certain programs that might be on the work computer and we'll kind of catch up to that at the end. So most of this is PowerPoint, but I will switch over to some real life examples and you're going to have a chance to give me some uh, uh, subjects or wording and we'll we'll test how good you are with your passwords we have a little check that will tell us after you put give me a suggestion for a password how long it would take a hacker to crack it and so you'll be surprised at some of the answers for this so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start my PowerPoint presentation and uh, uh, can you guys see the PowerPoint presentation no, you haven't shared your screen. Oh, yeah, that's true. I should have done that first. Okay, see, so yeah, I got off talking about all those things. And now I've shared the screen. And here's the PowerPoint presentation. Can you see it? Not, here it is, yep. Okay, so let me start this from the beginning. Okay, can you see it now? We can. Okay, so that's, that's our uh, introductory slide done by the Chamber. Thank you, Chamber. And this is Panther PC. So we're going to be discussing working safely, efficiently, and smartly, which I know all of you guys do anyway. But we're not going to talk, talk about the kind of chair you need to sit in or how often you need to stand up and do jumping jacks like John Salek. We won't be talking about those types of things, all right? All right. So this is kind of the uh, general uh, subjects we'll be talking about. And there'll be lots of slides in between. But we can talk about protecting your computer your data and your Wi-Fi network, make sure they're secure, that your data is backed up, that your computer has the necessary uh, security, antivirus programs, anti-malware programs, those types of things. We, we will always be referencing both Windows and Mac computers. We'll talk about password best practices. Look, I know m so many people, I get it all the time. I don't want to remember a password. I just want to use password. Okay, we're going to show you how bad that is. We'll show you about, give you a demonstration of a password manager that makes it easy to automatically fill in the passwords. Talk about two-factor authentication. I know many of you are using this already and also Authenticator apps. We'll put in some humorous, we have some cartoons of, of computer jokes and I always find that kind of breaks things up a little bit. We'll talk about breakfast Best practices for email safety, really, really important because almost all the attacks these days occur through links in emails. And we're going to talk about ransomware, link protection, and then how to safely browse the internet, keep yourself secure, private, clear your browsing history. We'll talk toward the end about virtual private networks. What are they? Do you need one? And then the last one, we'll just give a slide on working remotely into your office. Okay. So, you're there, you're at your laptop, you're at your computer, you're working, maybe you're on your phone, although most of us that do really business are gonna be on the computer. And so you, you gotta 
have security, and one of the first securities is you got to back up your data. Can't stress this enough. If you don't back up your data and your hard drive and your computer goes, you're in real tough shape. You're in really dire straits. So you want to have a backup strategy. There's a good expression called a three, two, one, which means you want to have your data in at least three different places on your computer, on a local device, like the external hard drive you see in the picture in the middle at the bottom and also up in the cloud. That's kind of what we want today so that if there's a failure in one place, you have other places to recover the data. And this is really, really important. All right. And so there are many different ways in the cloud of backing up, but the local hard drive, this could be a USB hard drive. This could be, I know people that back up on QuickBooks often put it on their little USB flash drive. They give it to their accountant. And uh, in the cloud, we'll talk about the different types of cloud backup strategies, including the file sharing services like OneDrive and Google Drive, iCloud, those types of things versus cloud backup like uh, uh, iDrive and Carbonite. But you want to make sure you have these three types of locations for your data. Very, very important. All right. So in Windows 10, which I think everybody's on who's on Windows is on Windows 10. Windows 10 has two different backup programs in the control panel. One is called file history, which you see a slide here. And if you click it, it'll ask you to set up the file history, ask you what do you want to back up by default, it just backs up your standard libraries. And it you ask, it tells you, uh, ask you what device you're going to put it on. Here's my Toshiba external hard drive and how often you want to run it. And this backs up your data to your external hard drive. And this does it incrementally during the day. You can set schedules, you can exclude things, but this is something that comes with Windows 10. Windows 10 also comes with another backup program, which is called the Windows 7 backup program. I use this uh, to create an image of the drive. So there's one thing that you want to do back up your data, very critical. But if you have a lot of programs, one customer I had seven years ago, didn't have a backup, didn't have a drive image. It took us seven hours to reinstall all of her software. She was a video photographer to put in all the Adobe. It took us seven hours. So if you have a lot of software, what we like to do is create an image of the drive. If the drive fails, we can restore the image in a much quicker period of time. All the software goes in, all the operating system. On Windows, I use the Windows 7 backup to create the drive image. And you see it's set to backup to the same external hard drive. Mac has a great backup program called Time Machine. So Time Machine can back up your data. It could back up snapshots of the, the system state. And you just, again, use an external hard drive. It's, it is a great program. And uh, those of you that on a, have a Mac should be using uh, a, either the Time Machine or another backup program. All right, so we're going to talk about now cloud backup and cloud file and sharing. So I know all of you are familiar with iCloud or OneDrive or Dropbox. Since I can't see all of you, I'm not going to do a handshake, but I'm sure many of you are using one of these, OneDrive or Dropbox or uh, iCloud, et cetera. So I want to kind of explain the difference between these types of cloud backups versus Carbonite, iDrive, and other types of cloud backups, because these are really called cloud sharing. They're designed so that if you have a, say, Dropbox account, you can put that account on your iPhone and your iPad and your Mac laptop and your Windows desktop. And when you save files into the Dropbox folder, you can see it on all your different devices and you can share it. Same thing with OneDrive, but you have to put the files in that particular folder that's there. If the files are in your desktop or your documents or pictures, they're not going to get backed up by the, these types of cloud services. That's where these other types of cloud services, which are really designed as cloud backup, iDrive is one of them, Carbonite's another one. They back up your desktop and your documents and your pictures and other folders. You can add the folders that you want 
they do a backup of that so you can restore all the data. I know I still store data often, most of the time in documents and desktop and pictures, et cetera. But sometimes I wanna share things and I'll use these other things. So let's see what we have here. So this is a, a screenshot of my computer, uh, of my folder structure on my computer. So you can see at the bottom, this PC, and there's your desktop, there's your documents, there's your download music, et cetera. If I save anything into those folders with a cloud backup, those get backed up to the cloud. If I save it in these folders, but I have OneDrive, they don't get backed up to OneDrive. Or if I have Dropbox, they don't get backed up to Dropbox. I have to put them there. But I have a couple of these file sharing programs, OneDrive from Microsoft and ShareSync, which is from Intermedia, of which I'm a reseller. And as you can see, I can create my separate folders in here, all right? And I can create folders to put things. You can create your own folder structure, but I have to save it here, not in the normal desktops or documents, et cetera. So if you're using the file sharing systems and you don't back up the data that's in your desktop or your documents, they won't get backed up. They'll get backed up locally, but they won't get backed up to the cloud. All right, so here's an example of iDrive. So iDrive can back up all these different folders. So these are a list of the folders that I have in my computer that are being backed up in iDrive. So desktop, act as my CRM program, uh, jokes, malware, here's my documents. So you see a backup, a true backup program lets me back up all types of folders all over the computer. It doesn't just have to be in one place, but you've got to have multiple backups. PC uh, iDrive is a, a, a very highly awarded one. I also resell Carbonite. So please, if you have any questions, you know, you can ask me during the presentation or you can ask me afterwards. I'd be happy to help you. Let's move on to another requirement when you're working remotely. You have to have good antivirus. You have to have protection against viruses and malware. And that includes Macs. As a matter of fact, most people think that Macs are more secure. From a virus standpoint, they are. But actually recently, over the last year, there have been a higher percentage of malware infections on Macs than on Windows computers. So you must have this type of protection. This is a list of some of the types of uh, current uh, and popular antivirus programs for Windows. Uh, many of you use Norton. I happen to use Webroot. Any of you that have Comcast at home, you get free seven installations of Norton. Free. They come with your Comcast subscription. AT&T, if you have home AT&T, you get McAfee, all right? So you can, for home, get some really good protection on your home computers without paying for it. And these are full featured programs. So please make sure you have it. Now, Windows 10 comes with a Windows antivirus program called Windows Defender. It's a decent program, but it's not as rated as highly as these other programs, but it's functional. I don't believe Macs come with any antivirus programs built in. So here's a list. I know it's kind of small of different antivirus programs. Norton is here, Avast, uh, Malwarebytes. There's a variety of programs. You won't spend time. Please have an antivirus program on your computer. Another important thing for being safe is making sure your operating system and your programs are updated. Many updates are security updates that the vendors, Microsoft and Apple, issue because they find holes or flaws in portions of the code. This code is so complex, you know, tens of millions of lines of code that you find this over time. So make sure you have your updates on. This is a picture in Windows 10 of your update screen. I'm up to date as of yesterday and make sure it puts that in on the Mac, okay? Here's kind of the instructions. If, if you're not set, you could check, make sure that automatic updates are on in the Mac. Uh, and again, you can look that up, et cetera. I'm not gonna spend much time on it, but it's very important that your operating system stays up to date to be protected, all right? That's critical. Okay, so now we've talked about kind of protecting your computer. We're protecting your data. We're protecting something from happening with a virus or malware. 
and we're talk, we're talking about protecting the operating system. Now we're going to move on because your computer's hooked up to a network of some sort. At work, you may have a much more complex network. I'm sure if we went to see David Reese at Land Infotech, we'd see zillions of computers and Cisco routers and hardware firewalls. We don't use that at home. But all of us have some type of modem. This is a Comcast modem. This is an AT&T modem. And the third one over, that's a Netgear Nighthawk modem router. So we all have that. And there are certain things you need to do to make sure you're safe with that. First thing is you want to change the factory password. When they ship, the password oftentimes is password. Not a really good choice. So you can log into the router, like I just logged into a Comcast the other day. The username was admin, the password was password. Immediately popped up and said, enter a new password. Put in a nice password. That minimizes the risk of somebody breaking into the router and maybe changing some of the code or do something like that. Many of you are on Wi-Fi. If you're on wired, you don't worry about the need for these next steps here, but you want to use strong encryption. So most of you have heard of the term encryption. Encryption is where you scramble algorithmically the data with all these numbers. And so you take its original data, you scramble it, and then it gets unscrambled at the other end. For home use, the strongest encryption is WPA2, which means Wi-Fi protected access number two. PSKAES is just the uh, type of algorithm it uses. So you're going to use that with a, a strong Wi-Fi password. We're going to go more into passwords here in a second. Strong passwords often suggest that almost all the modern modems and routers come with a separate guest network. So if you have people coming over a lot, your kids, friends, and other, maybe you don't want them on your, your business network or your home network. So you can actually set up a guest network with a different name and a different password and let them use that. And that minimizes the risk because you never know what teenagers are going to do when they get on their devices. Last thing again, some people choose to hide the network name, which is called the SSID, or enable Mac. Mac in the computer world means media access. Uh, and it's a specific number that every device that gets on a network has worldwide. We won't go into that. It is an option for that. This is my Comcast router. I'm logged into the Comcast router. All right. And you can see these are my Wi-Fi settings. I have two different Wi-Fi networks, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So my phone, my tablets, all that is connected. My laptops are connected to it. You can see MAC addresses. I'm not going to go into this, but this is the type of encryption. Very strong as long as you use a strong password. OK, this is fun here. We're going to go and I'm going to minimize this screen here. and. I just want to make sure, can you see my other screen here? My, with, can you see my icons and things? Can you see my, okay, let me see if I can. Uh, password test. Okay, you're still seeing the, the password. The password, right. Okay. See. Okay, hold on a second here. So let me um, get back to Zoom here. Let's see, okay. Uh, okay, excellent. Okay, what can you see now? How secure is your password? Oh, now we got them both. Okay, you see where I clicked? Can you see what I'm doing here? Yeah. Okay, see that, okay. So now we get some things from the audience. Since many of you remember John Podesta, you guys remember John Podesta, Richard? Vaguely. He was Hillary Clinton's yes. uh, DNC chairman and got hacked. Yes. What yes. was he using as a password? He was using password one, okay? Weak password, hackers could crack it in 55 minutes. Not a good password to use. How about um, Astro from the Jetsons? 0.17 seconds to crack it. Not too good. All right, uh, who wants to volunteer a password for me to type in here? Susan, give me a password. To, let's say how strong that password is. Everybody's jumping to give up their passwords. You notice that? Well, you, you could just modify it in some way. How about give the one you use all the time? How, how about popcorn? <laughs> okay. And the numbers one, two, three. 
Okay, good. So we did popcorn three hundredths of a second to crack that. Let's just put in one. Thirteen hundredths of a second. Put in two. Eight seconds. And oh, one, two, three apparently is a very common sequence. More than one, two. So it dropped down to 0.19 seconds. Not too good. So let's change the P to a capital P. Okay, 0.38 seconds. Not too good. A hacker could crack this just like that. All right. So let's do this. A lot of times you'll see people want to tell you to put in a symbol. Let's put in a dollar sign. Well, 35 seconds. So it's still not a good password. All right. Uh, so let's try something like uh, Duke. Let's try this. Duke was my dog in New York. Okay, two years to crack that password. All right, that's a much better thing. So long strings of things are much more recommended than short little things. Now let's just put a dollar sign after it. Oh, 176 years to crack this password. So when you create- Yeah, but Lance, that's too long. People aren't gonna keep typing that password but over it, See, over. The, the idea, Karen, is if you use something you remember, an expression, I lived in Cary, North Carolina. That is very easy to remember. There's nothing hard to, because otherwise, if you can't, look, we, we already saw how bad it is to use password one, two, three. It, yeah, it, but here's an idea of just using initials or lower and uppercase initials for things you'd remember and nobody ahead. else give, would know what Give me something. For. Give me something. Um, you could start with your initials of your business and then go into uh, a name that it, with the one letter off so it's not a real word and then a couple of symbols. Okay, so I put in MMV for multimedia video, all right? And put in some numbers here that you would remember. And then maybe put in a name like um, uh, K-A-R-N. Okay. And then maybe uh, number two and assign a uh, exclamation point. Okay, so seven months to crack the password. So it's getting harder to crack, right. So I think I've given you some examples, but the best way to do this is to use a password manager. Because with a password, and I'm gonna show you some examples, with a password manager, you can either automatically generate passwords or put long passwords in and the password manager remembers them and automatically fills them in for you. So I use a password manager. I do have my password saved elsewhere. I do save them in a password protected spreadsheet, but let me show you a password manager here, all right? So I'm gonna, all right, so I use RoboForm. Yes. Right, RoboForm, LastPass, Dashlane. We're gonna talk about some of these things but I'm gonna put in, this is what's called the master password. Now, if you don't remember this, you're really in trouble. So you better remember the master password, write it down, put it in your uh, chest of drawers, put it in your closet somewhere. All right, so as you can see here, with a password manager, these are all the different sites that the password manager is remembering for me. So for example, if I wanted to log into, uh, Let's try Google. Google may not be the best one. Okay, it's logging in, all right. So it automatically filled in the password for Google. I didn't have to remember it. And same thing for these other sites. There's many different password managers. That is the recommended way to have good passwords. Uh, and you can check, look, you could check that password, uh, the password test that we just did, see if your password is good. If you use a password manager, all you're gonna have to do is remember the master password. So let me get back here for a second, back to my uh, PowerPoint presentation here. Okay. Uh, okay, is that it? Okay, are you seeing my uh, screen now? 
Are you seeing the you yes. seen the PowerPoint? Okay, just let me start from the current slide here. Okay, so these are a variety of different password managers. Some are free, some are paid. The paid are not expensive. The first six are, are all of these work for Windows and Mac. Mac has a very good password manager called Keychain Access. It's a really, really good program. So if you have a Mac, you could use that. I use RoboForm. LastPass is a great one. Zoho Keeper, Dashlane. Look into that. If you want to talk to me about it, just call me. Okay, another thing. I'm sure a lot of you are using two-factor authentication where you get a code sent to your cell phone when you're trying to log into a website. There's also authentication app. Let's see if I can run this video here. And I'm probably going to have to share this with you because you probably are still see Okay. So you're probably still seeing the PowerPoint slide. So let me just, again, uh, reshare that here. And this is going to be this one here. Okay. Okay. Do you see the YouTube video now? Yes, we do. We're not hearing the sound, and you have to do the drop down menu oh. and enable okay, the on. sound. The drop down. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, so you're not hearing the sound. sound. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You have to en enable it in the drop down. Yeah, I had that on. the other day. It, it came up. Uh, View options or something. Oh, more. Those uh, three dots. Yeah, more. Enable oh, share sound. computer sound. Okay, let's try it again here. Well, and enable sound. Okay. Uh, I'm only seeing share computer sound. And uh, let's see here. Sound. Yeah, share sound or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, tell me if... Is your fingerprint. Are you hearing it? factor means the system is using two of these options. In most cases, the extra authentication is simply a numeric code, a few digits sent to your phone, which can only be used once. You can get that code via text message or a specialized smartphone app called an authenticator. Once linked to your accounts, the app displays a constantly rotating set of codes you can use whenever needed. The arguable leader in this area is Google Authenticator, which is free on Android and iOS. Other authenticators include Duo Mobile, SaaSpass, and LastPass Authenticator, which all do the same thing on mobile and some desktop platforms, while the majority of popular password managers all have 2FA by default. You can also go to twofactorauth.org to find a list of services that support 2FA. As you panic over how hard this all sounds, remember this. Being secure isn't easy. The bad guys count on you being lax and protecting yourself in order to grab your information. Implementing 2FA means it takes a little longer to log in each time on a new device, but it's worth it in the long run to avoid some serious theft, be it of your identity, data, or money. Okay. Okay, you should be able to see my um, PowerPoint again, right? Yes. Okay. All right, so you see the two-factor authentication. Many of you are using that. That's great where it's available. This is an example of using two-factor in Facebook. There's in Facebook settings, use the two-factor. Uh, he was talking about Google Authenticators, the most popular one. Uh, you could put it on your phone, put it on your computers. Microsoft has an authenticator. I use the Microsoft authenticator and it sends you a code to the authenticator. Oftentimes, like with Google, it'll pop up something saying, is this you? But this is the two factor. If you can use it, use it. 
the hackers, they're terrible. Two-factor authentication is available for Apple as well. So use that as well. Ah, time for some jokes here. All right. Uh, yeah, good. I see Rosanna, she's laughing. So I think the first one must be from about, what, 15 years ago, right? Looks like those are old monitors. And when it says the resolution is 1024 by 768, that's a long, long time ago, OK? Uh, the second one is is almost, it's kind of funny with uh, what's going on now. But here's uh, the uh, elderly people in their underwear. Uh, but their computer crashed and they had to go to the store. They couldn't buy from Amazon anymore. And then, of course, the last one, AOL, you've got mail that's been around for like 30 years. Grandma keeps hearing it on the computer, so she keeps going out to the mailbox to check her mail. All right. So one of the things in the computer world, like your business as well, we got to have some humor. All right. Otherwise, we just go like nuts. All right. So uh, I wanted to show you some more things about, uh, you know, being safe here, uh, particularly with, uh, we talked about the passwords, authenticator apps. I want to talk about email and email safety. Almost all the big attacks that occur go come through email. They come through links and emails. That's the way the hackers get into the big computer systems. And we'll go through a list of some of the major hacks that have occurred, the damage it can happen to you. I've had three or four customers in the last two years. Some of them weren't my customers and may not and aren't now, but they called me because they went up to their computer and every Word file and Excel file had this long string of random numbers and letters. They'd been attacked and they all the files were encrypted. All right. And really, really dangerous, which is why you have to have the cloud backup because the local hard drive, if you get this type of ransomware, it will encrypt the local hard drive as well. All right. So what I wanted to show you here is, um, and I'm going to, um, again, minimize this, and I want to bring up here my actual, uh, my actual email here. All right. And let me share again. Uh, okay. Can you see my email screen? No? Yes. Do you see my, oh, yes. I, can you see my, okay. So this yeah. is my Outlook uh, email screen. So what I wanna show you here is, I'm just gonna go, this is a business I don't do much with anymore. This is my point of sale business. I have like two customers in the United States. There's no protection for links. So I'm just going to show you. So for standard Gmail, uh, Yahoo Mail, Bell South Mail, when you click on a link, it goes to where the link is pointing. But what you see, it may not be where the link actually goes. So if you just move the mouse and you hover over the link, can you see where it says the HTTPS slash less clicks? So if you're not sure the email or where the link goes, you could hover the mouse over it it will show you where it's pointing. Now, when it's a rogue link, this might say like something, uh, helpputin.ru, all right? It's not gonna say view details, it'll say helpputin.ru. You don't wanna click on that link. Now, th the only issue with that is we get so many emails that are you gonna do this for every link you see in the email? Probably not. And you get busy. It looks like it's from somebody that you know, and you click on the link, and all kinds of bad things can happen. Now, uh, Microsoft, for their free email system, so this is Hotmail, they also have MSN, LiveMail, and Outlook.com. And so what I want to show you here is when I click on the Get Started link, you could see it says MS Settings. Winder Insider opt, and I wanted to do a different one that showed, okay, so for the free emails, what Microsoft does is they check the link against known blacklists, and the blacklists are a list of bad websites, and if you're on that blacklist, it won't let you go there. The problem is blacklists are not updated all the time. They take long times to populate, so as long as that link 
was pointing to the blacklist, you're okay. But it's called safe links and it's better than what we just saw before where there is no link protection, all right? So that's available for all the free Microsoft accounts uh, and a G Suite, the pay G Suite, you can get link protection as well. I'm gonna show you the highest link protection. All right, so I'm gonna go here. This is, for example, this is, uh, all right. So this is a name badge, which you probably have heard of. They make badges and things like that. And you can see, I just hovered over the, the clear face shield. You notice it says HTTPS URL dot email protection dot link. So a number of services, Intermedia is one that I resell for. The link is automatically sent up to their cloud servers where it's then passed on to the final destination from the cloud server where it's checked for maliciousness. If it's malicious, it never connects through. If it's not malicious, they'll let you connect through. So these are the different levels. Just remember, this is where most of the danger comes in email. Now you can get an email from an infected attachment, but most of these guys are scanning the attachments for viruses ahead of time. And if they find an attachment with a virus, the email providers are taking it out. They can't do that with links as easily, all right? So let me get back to, let me get back here because we don't wanna run over. So let me get back to, uh, uh, we've done that. Okay. Uh, let me get back to the PowerPoint here. Okay. And let me do share. Where's the PowerPoint here? Okay. We're back to the PowerPoint. You're not see you are seeing the PowerPoint. Roseanne saying we're seeing the PowerPoint. Oops. Oh. Okay. Okay, are you seeing the Amazon phishing email? What are you seeing? No, password Best manager? Password manager. Password. Password. You're seeing password manager. manager, okay. Password manager. Okay. What do you see now, the Amazon? Amazon phishing. Okay, so um, this is an example of an Amazon phishing email. So a phishing email is an email that's generated to get you to click on something so they can get personal information, attack your computer, et cetera. There's a number of signs of these. On this one, you notice it says management at amazoncanada.ca. That's not a legitimate. And again, I apologize if you can't. Uh, let me just try to get this down here. Okay. Uh, let me go here. Slideshow. Okay. Current slide here. Oh, what's going on? Okay. So look at the where it's coming from that's one of the first hints all right uh other hints are like this one shown hover over the link at the bottom and when you do this said http redirect dot .com. well that's not an amazon email that's a phishing email dear client is not as personal but these are some of the ways you can manually check that these emails are phishing emails. Here's one from the IRS. You see it's from ahr at irxt.com. That's not the IRS. Who the hell knows who they are? This is uh, what they call scam emails. They, this is called scareware. You get a pop-up that says your computer's infected. You must call this number. Otherwise your computer will burn up in the atmosphere upon re-entry. This is scareware. Most of the time, if you just restart the computer, it goes away. Don't call any of these numbers, please. This is a Mac scam. I know you can't read it, but Macs are not immune to these types of scams either. All right, let's talk a little bit about ransomware. This is a dangerous, dangerous thing. Your computer gets hacked, click the link, all your data gets encrypted and you're in real, real trouble. All right, so let's just go through some quickly, some of the big hacks that have occurred with ransomware. One of the first ones, Hollywood Presbyterian Center. FBI recommends you don't pay the ransom because it's not a guarantee that you're gonna get the decryption key back. That's why you wanna have the cloud backup. Cloud backups can't be damaged by the ransomware. A local drive can be damaged. And so that's why you wanna have the cloud backup as well. Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital got hacked. 
All the data got hacked, went through the network, just like kind of the coronavirus. They decided to pay the $17,000 ransom because I think David was mentioning before, the cost of restoring the data was going to be $250,000 for their IT department to restore the internal data. And they would have been down like six or seven days. So they paid the ransom. They got the data back. San Francisco Metro Metropolitan Transit Authority, WannaCry, uh, you know, you've read about this. There's one in Atlanta up in uh, Florida. Here's Florida. Riviera Beach paid $600,000 to the ransomware people. All right. I've known people, lawyers and other people that have gotten this. All right. This is why you have to be careful and why you, with, particularly with emails and links, you want to be extremely careful or you want to have an email system that gives you the link protection. Okay. Uh, this is the outlook.com. Uh, this is just a list of some of the good providers. The one I represent in the media, this is from PC World, I think, uh, was one of the editor's choices on it, along with the Microsoft Office 365. So, you know, if you don't have good protection right now, or you don't know what you have, call me and we'll, we'll walk through it. Okay. When you, with link protection you, in intermediate, you can turn it on. And when no links are found, it tells you that it's safe to go to that uh, link. So that's what that screen is showing here. All right, let's, we're gonna move on from email safety. Now we're gonna talk about web surfing. So we all use Google, I think, uh, you know, there's some other search engines, Bing and Yahoo, but Google is by far the most popular. And when you search, you could get some potentially dangerous results. You know, particularly like adult sites, gambling sites, or if you type in something wrong in your search, oftentimes it winds up with these really dangerous searches. So a lot of the antivirus programs have built in a web safety. This is an example of uh, my web route on I searched free antivirus. And you can see most of it is a green check mark, but here's one that has a very a caution sign. That means this might have potentially dangerous code that could get injected into your computer if you visit this website. So you probably should not go to that website unless you happen to know, like say Rosanna, you know that it's a real estate site that you have to go to and you know, you, you're gonna take the risk because it's probably okay. But if this came up with a red thing, you don't wanna go to that site, all right? Here's one, this is Norton. Norton shows you a green check mark for safe an untested one, it doesn't know, an unsafe site, and a caution site. So this helps you when you do searches, when you see the results to kind of make a decision that these are safe sites to visit or there's risk involved with that. A good thing, a good thing to have, all right? Uh, so give some thought, again, your antivirus or security suite, many of them have this type of protection and it's a good idea to have that. Let's just talk a little more about web surfing. Many of us are concerned about uh, tracking. Uh, you search for a bed on your computer. You go over to your cell phone and you bring up your Safari or your Google Chrome and there's an ad for the bed. Has anybody, has anybody had that happen to them? Okay, so how did they get that ad? Well, what they did is when you were searching in the other place and you went to the website, it puts what are called cookies on your computer. These are little pieces of, of text that help tell their site, like some of the things you're viewing or if you're customizing the page, and they know it. And so when you visit these different sites, again, Google keeps track of that. Most being, this is the way they sell your data to advertisers. Now, most of it is, is not personal data. It's just generalized uh, data that helps them understand in a geography or for an age group or other things, people on Comcast, that these are the uh, statistics. That, so the advertiser can pin their marketing toward those types of uh, markets. And so if you don't like that, there's a couple of ways you can sort of help protect yourself. Google has what's called an incognito mode. Anyone use the incognito mode on Google Chrome before? So the incognito mode, if you say you have a Google Chrome icon in your taskbar, if you right click on it, you see a choice that says incognito mode. So what incognito mode does is it's called private browsing. When you end it, it erases all of the 
data that you downloaded, the cookies, the images, the history, it erases it. But during the time you're surfing, that information is still going out. Those cookies and other things are still being sent out. Comcast and AT&T are tra getting all that stuff. But once you close it, it erases it. All right. So it gives you a little more control over the continuous buildup of the things you visit. All right. Uh, w this is an example. All the browsers let you clear your tracking history. Now, there are settings that when you close the browser, it'll automatically clear it. Here's an example in Google Chrome of clearing my browsing histories, my cookies, and all of my images and files. I could have pressed clear the data. It would erase them. You could do it for the last hour, the last 24 hours, the last week, the last month, the custom time range for all time. So occasionally, particularly if you're concerned, I'm not bothered as much that I see a bed that I was searching. It just, I, I search computer parts or things with computers. I, it's not a big concern to me. Uh, but if I'm searching certain maybe financial things, stocks and other things, then I'm more, I don't want them to know that, clear the browsing history. So this is some of the privacy controls that you have. I know there's a lot of stuff here, guys. So don't try to remember it all. Um, I'll make this PowerPoint available to the chamber. And please, feel free to call me. Just don't call collect. Okay. Now, another way to, to really mask your surfing habits is what's used what's called a VPN, a virtual private network. A VPN kind of puts a hole through the, the Comcast and AT&T. It goes out to other servers. Many of them are offshore. And then it comes back to the website. It really masks all the things that you're doing in terms of where you're browsing. And so many, many people are using it. I'm just, before I play the video, I'm just going to show you some things. Why do you need a VPN? It really helps when you're in public Wi-Fi spots where there's no security, all right? And so in many places, the Wi-Fi network is unsecured. In an unsecured network, you do not want to be logging into your bank or other things. Somebody sitting there could be stealing those passwords. So a VPN helps protect you from that, from that happening. Now, I still wouldn't, I'm still leery about ever in an airport visiting my bank or other financial site. I wouldn't do it on an unsecured network. But the VPN helps you uh, block things. Now, people in other countries sometimes use VPN to get past the government restrictions. We don't have that as much. So here's some statistics. About half have never used a VPN. About a quarter uh, maybe don't use it anymore, used it in the past. 18% they use it on the laptop and 6, 5, 6, 5 on the uh, smartphone or tablet and other places. The one thing sometimes to be concerned about VPNs is it can really slow the internet down depending on the traffic and the VPN you're using. So uh, that's something you have to be able to uh, accept as a trade-off, all right? Now, I wanna just go back here to uh, this here. Let's see if we can. The internet is where all the cool stuff is, but. Okay. So let me. Uh, get back to this thing here with share, new share, uh, which one is this? Okay, can you see the, the YouTube now? Can you see the YouTube video? Okay. It's not secure by design. When you visit a website, your computer sends your data through your local network, through the internet service provider's infrastructure, and finally, to the server where the website actually lives. All along the way, sinister eyes could be peering in at your activity. Out on the web, advertisers and spies can track your movements between websites by noting your IP address. Your ISP can sell anonymized metadata about you and your activities to whomever they wish. Thanks, Congress. And there are even threats closer to home. If you're on an unsecured Wi-Fi network, anyone could be watching. That's where a virtual private network, or VPN, comes in. When you switch it on, 
it creates an encrypted tunnel between you and a server run by the VPN company. Your data flows through the tunnel, so the ISP and anyone on your network can't see what you're doing. And because your data exits from the VPN server to the internet, you appear to have its IP address, helping mask your identity online. VPNs help get around censorship and region-locked content by spoofing your location. If you choose a VPN server in another country, you can make it appear that you're surfing the web from Germany instead of Milwaukee. That's great for streaming video and, you know, avoiding government censorship. For more on VPNs like which is the best and which is the fastest, check out PCMag.com. Okay, we're back to here. All right, this is just, again, you look up uh, best VPNs. There's a whole bunch of them uh, that you can, uh, some are free, some are paid. The paid ones are obviously better. Uh, just look it up. If you want to talk more about it, please contact me. Now, how many of you, I uh, can't really do this, but there is a, a web browser called Opera. Opera is made in Sweden and it's highly used in Europe. Opera comes with a built-in VPN that you can turn on or turn off. So if, if the Opera download is free and you can work with it and see how a VPN, is, does it affect your speed or does it not affect your speed? So once in a while, when I wanna use a VPN, I use my Opera browser and I turn the VPN on, all right? And then we have uh, one more, Thing, which is some of you will want to remote into your office computer and work from your computer but see the screen of your office computer. Many people will do that if there are programs on the work computer that are not available on the home computer. And so you need a program that lets you remote in. These are some of the programs, uh, Remote PC, Splashtop, Zoho, Zoho, Team Viewer, there's another one called Go to My PC. These are different programs. They are, are all paid programs that you can use to remote into your work computer. I've used Splashtop and Remote PC. I really wasn't happy with Remote PC. Splashtop did work well. I've used Go to My PC. Very good, but pretty expensive these days. Team Viewer also is expensive. You may have heard Windows has something called Remote Desktop where you can do that, but I don't recommend it. Uh, too many security holes with Remote Desktop. It's in the news. They don't recommend using Remote Desktop. So the, these kind of are lower end. The go to my PC is very expensive, but if you want to do remote work into your uh, office computer, this is the way you can do it. And that kind of finishes my presentation. Uh, this is my contact information. Uh, you can call me at 954-317-3829. You can email me at lance at pantherpc.com. And I'd be happy to talk to any of you, expand more on what we've discussed today, answer any of your questions. And I think at this point, uh, Jeannie, could we just open it up to questions? Would that be all right? So let me stop sharing my screen, I guess, here. Sure, Lance, you can go ahead and ask, uh, have the audience ask you questions. Okay. Yeah, right. I, haven't, I haven't muted anyone, so everybody's just got themselves oh. on mute. Lance, I have a question. Um, I pay for CyberGhost, uh, and um, I uh, don't know, is it any better than Incognito in um, Google? I don't know, Karen, because I have not used CyberGhost before. Uh, I, who makes that? Do you know who makes that uh, program? I forget. Okay. I'm just not familiar with that program, so I can't answer that question for you, but okay. maybe we can talk about it uh, All right. sometime. Okay. Um, Lance? Yeah, Roger. You're still sharing your screen. Oh, um, okay. Uh, and... Uh, on okay, the, uh, there we go, okay. Yeah, on the remote uh, programs that you were talking about, I, I've been using LogMeIn for many years and it works really well. Okay. Um, and I, but I noticed that wasn't on your list. I thought they were one of the top ones. Yeah, you know, I just, um, the list just came from uh, searching the web for the best 
remote programs. And like anything else, you saw I used RoboForm for my past manager, password manager. Five, six years ago when I started using it, it was the number one. Now it's down to number six. So, so yeah, these programs do rotate. But uh, just what Roger said, if, if Roger's had really good success with log me in, that would, as people who know Roger, uh, push it up the list, definitely. Yeah, I, I've actually been using it for 15 years, and uh, I have a, a, a rather advanced subscription that's about $800 a year, but uh, you can get it smaller subscriptions for much, much less than that. Yeah, so in a lot of cases, it's these prices vary a lot, like the remote PC, I think is $20 a year, and then the splash top was 60, but uh, those of you that know Jeff Seltzer, I set Jeff up originally with the remote PC, and we had lots of problems with it, lots of problems. So we had poor visibility, we had stretching and other things like that. So we put the splash top on and that worked really well and that was $60 a year. So a lot of times it's just kind of what experience you have with it. But if any of you, you know, are interested, let me know. Chadi, you must have a question for me. I do have a testimonial for you. Oh, we'll take that as well, of course. <laughs> I have worked with Lance where he worked on my computer at home, my compu our computers, and my previous job. And I just recommend I referred him to a friend of ours, a fellow Kiwanian that he was able to assist. So I highly recommend you. You are the consummate professional. And uh, I do thank you for this is very enlightening. I didn't yeah. realize how involved this is. Yeah, and again, I apologize for presenting so much information. No, it's good. But I wanted you to be aware of it. And because we can talk about this individually and we kind of do our one-on-ones, I kind of enjoy that. Uh, you know, we get to do one-on-ones at the same time you're asking me questions. Uh, it kind of serves two purposes. So uh, thank you for, for the uh, testimonial, Chadia. Hmm. You earned it, my dear. Roseanne is, ah, oh, then actually we can hear you. How do you come up with your name for Panther? I've always been a cat lover. Okay. And the, the Panther is the state animal in Florida. Yeah. So that's how I came up with it. Okay, cool. Yeah. So before we get much later, I just want to let everybody know that the uh, small business, the next level small business education series is going to have a bunch of things going on this month. We're trying to attempt to do uh, two per week. And so uh, we've got uh, quite a few coming up. We've got Paul Cavanaugh and uh, Jeff Seltzer with, uh, they're gonna talk about how people are making money in this down market. Um, we've also got Jonathan Feldman talking about uh, where to find money in insurance policies. Uh, I'm going to be talking next Tuesday about readying for reopening and uh, coming up with a strategic plan on how to get that going on. And uh, this week on Thursday, we've got the positive leadership approach to thinking during troubled times, which is happening uh, with the nonprofit group. Uh, so we want to make sure that everybody gets the word out and gets a lot of people on for all those different events that are coming up. So thank you so much, Lance. And Lance, as always, consummate professional. You did a great job. Thank you so much for, uh, for doing all of this, because this is a lot of work to put together a presentation. And that's all, uh, as you know, that change is on a dime. So he's been researching and everything else and making sure everything's up to date. So thank you so much for everything. So if anybody, does anybody else have any more questions? If no, I just want to thank Lance for running our enterprise groups, too. He's been helping with Lewis, so that's been a huge assistance, Lance, and thank you for the time. Yeah, Janie, you know, uh, I think the Pompano Chamber, everybody that w w all of us really work hard together, and I know Marianne was on it, but she wasn't on it, but she works hard, and yeah. everybody during this time has really been really putting a lot of effort into it. And I think it's just great. I, I want to figure out how we can just recruit more and more people. 
Good, wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming out. And uh, we'll see you uh, on Thursday and next Tuesday and next Thursday and next Tuesday. <laughs> Go forward. All right. On Take and care. on. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys.